the Women's World Cup show on Off the Ball with Sure Non-Stop Protection Deodorant, official sponsor of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023. Now then, the uh, World Cup is progressing without Ireland, as we know. We're into the knockout stages. And I suppose an interesting area to pick up on is that this was billed in advance, rightly or wrongly, as USA being the team to beat, going for an unprecedented third World Cup in a row, three in a row. And they're not setting the world alight. They have Sweden in the round of 16 on Sunday in Melbourne. Sweden, obviously, a very good team. Very happy to say Sandra Herrera of CBS is with us. Sandra, thanks for the time. Happy to be here. Happy to chat all things women's football with you. So I, I mentioned there, rightly or wrongly, the tournament was billed in advance as Team USA versus everybody else. How fair was that at the outset, do you think? Was that, you know, they're going for three in a row, a more experienced um, team? Uh, the, the, the age numbers are creeping up, but still it felt like they were the team to beat. Is that how you guys saw the tournament in advance? Yeah, you know, I, I would venture to say that you know, there was a little bit of a maybe 60, 40, 70, 30 kind of angle there. I think when it comes to, you know, being the number one ranked team in the world, the reigning champions, um, you know, longevity within these tournaments comes that kind of layer of expectation and, and pressures when you go into another World Cup. So absolutely, I think that was there for this United States squad, especially considering their draw that they got with other teams in, in Group E. Um, but I also think there was there's a, a, another eye towards kind of the expanded field of, of 32 teams in this tournament as a whole, knowing with all of those expectations that this was also probably going to be the most challenging, difficult uh, World Cup for, for these players. So the group stages thus far, USA started in fine fashion against Vietnam, who are 32nd in the world. They beat them 3-0. Sophia Smith scored two goals. Lindsay Horn scored a goal. Next up, it was the Dutch. It was a one-all draw. Horn scored the only goal of the game, or the only goal for the US. And then I suppose where... Um, eyebrows were raised without overstating things was against Portugal nil all draw USA by all accounts very very poor Portugal hit the post and that could have knocked the US out which would have been uh, really quite something they got away with it and now they have Sweden in the knockout stages so how disappointing have the US performances been thus far yeah, I don't think that's an I don't think that's unfair framing, you know, at all when it comes to to this team and the American audiences who are looking at it or European audiences who will maybe expect it a bit more from this number one ranked team in the world. And I think historically for this United States national team, they have kind of prided themselves on on growing stronger as tournaments go on. And and maybe there's perhaps still a little bit of of that element for this team as they now look ahead to the knockout rounds, but just us narrowing that lens on the group stage they got off to a good start they went out and won the game that folks expected them to win against the debutante vietnam and went toe-to-toe with the netherlands who are another top 10 ranked team in in this tournament and fell short of of scoring and kind of looking like a lethal attacking team against another debutante side in in portugal and there's also a counter argument to to you know, take a look at and see how other national team programs have sort of um, taken that next step a little bit and, and ensured that uh, there are resources and development that's happening for their national team programs. And I think Portugal is a very, very good example of that. Finally cracking through and breaking through to their first ever World Cup and, and really playing this United States team just in 2021 and held them to uh, one goal even back then. Um, so to sort of see things in, in this particular match against Portugal, I think there's there's a layer of why didn't they come out with all three points and where have the goals gone? But also looking at Portugal, like you said, just inches away from the possible biggest upset of, of all time in, in women's World Cup history. Mm. And sometimes I think we can both agree that the soccer gods smile upon teams and sometimes it's not your day. And and I think obviously if, if that goal does happen, we have a little bit of a different discussion in this one, but it doesn't. And now this United States team, everything that they're saying out of this group stage 
they're already putting that behind them and trying to look ahead to this next knockout run. Yeah. It was interesting after the Portugal game, the match was on Fox Sports and the camera cut to the US players signing autographs, but also doing a bit of dancing, a bit of singing. And former US captain Carly Lloyd was in the Fox studio. And I'll play the clip. She wasn't overly enamored, I think, with the carry on. Have a listen. I have never witnessed, and just seeing these images for the first time right now on the desk, I have never witnessed something like that. There's a difference between being respectful of the fans and saying hello to your family, but to be dancing, to be smiling. I mean, the player of the match was that post. You were lucky to not be going home right now. Boom. Now we're talking. Yeah, absolutely. She was fired up after that one, right? But um, look, you're you're talking to someone who um, I love smiling and dancing uh, personally. So I uh, I I know I'm in a different position than a former player mm. who's maybe being very reactive, right? Immediately towards uh, a lackluster performance by a team that she had spent a, a long time with, and you know we've got Carly Lloyd now almost about 24 hours later um, apologizing and or clarifying some of her reaction and statements that she made uh, that night. And, and I think, you know, perception is reality for a lot of people. And I think you have, again, a, a former prolific player and, and Lloyd who was very reactive to that. And, and maybe someone like me or someone else who looks at that and, and sees players who are trying to essentially keep a good mindset together yeah. when i yeah. see you know a, a crystal a dunn or or an emily sonnet you know cracking jokes or doing a little bit of dancing or interacting with fans and or family to me that's just ensuring that they still have that mindset in place going forward you got to have a short memory i think you know if you're a professional athlete trying to navigate a world cup tournament we hear that so often from from pro athletes that you can't dwell too long on those kinds of moments especially in a world cup tournament in which the turnaround is very very quick um so it doesn't surprise me that a lloyd was very reactive in, in that moment but it also doesn't surprise me that she is um had time to to, to think about, um, you know, her own comments on on the team moving forward, you know, saying that she deeply cares about the program. And that is kind of where that all stems from going going forward. And and honestly, it's it's a bit of a moot point because yeah. there are actual things on the pitch that this team has to figure out ahead of their game against Sweden. Yeah, we won't dwell on it overly, but I do have the clip, the second clip of Carly Lloyd. Obviously, her initial reaction must have generated a bit of blowback. So uh, here she is subsequently, as you've alluded to, maybe rowing back a touch. Have a listen. Well, I'd like to state that obviously I was very critical of the team last night. I've had some time to reflect, to sleep on it, and I want people to understand that I care deeply about this team. I poured my heart and soul into this team for 17 years, and it was based off of a legacy that was just passed down from generation to generation, the mentality, the DNA of what makes that team so great. And so... My comments were reflective on me wanting to see that legacy continue to be passed down from generation to generation. And with that, it, it comes with hard work. It comes with focus. And so my hope is that that continues because that is what makes the U.S. so special and so deadly. And that is what ultimately has won us championship. So that's fair enough. You can understand that point, I suppose, Sandra. I mean, there is lots of experience when uh, Carly Lloyd's talking there about the generations handing down the culture to the next generation. I mean, Megan Rapinoe is 38 years of age. Alex Morgan is 34 years of age. So I don't know. I mean, maybe there's just a degree of the kids these days and that's just fine as well, you know? Yeah, no, I hear you. I, again, I think I think that's part of it, right? I think I think that's something that these veterans have kind of embraced a little bit as well. They know that they've got a lot of first time World Cup debutants of their own on this team while we're celebrating, you know, this World Cup and how it's expanded to 32 teams and how there's been eight. There's now eight debutant teams to have celebrated during the group stage. But the United States themselves have. 14 players who had never gone through this experience. And we hear a lot um, from these veteran players, some that I've spoken with and uh, Alyssa Nair specifically in, in wanting to take on some of that pressure 
for those younger players and for those inexperienced players and how important that is to play that role as a veteran player. So when I see, again, a Crystal Dunn or an Emily Sonnet, you know, dancing or a, a Kelly O'Hara kind of giving a bit of a, of, of a put your chin up kind of speech to this team. These, these are examples to me of veterans who are trying to absorb mm. some of that pressure that maybe these first timers are not used to navigating. Yeah. So, I mean, from the outside, <laughs> uh, I just wonder, I, as happens with any country when they're they're navel gazing and focused on their own performances, how serious do you think this is? Because uh, it's one particularly bad performance against Portugal. They're probably entitled to that. They could very easily go on and win this competition and this will all be a distant memory. And, and lots of teams who do win the competition start slowly and, and, and warm up as it goes on. How worried are you about the Sweden game? How deep-rooted are the problems, do you think, Sandra? Oh, there's absolutely problems. I think, again, that's absolutely fair criticism for this team. I think you and I are speaking a bit about the Portugal game in, in terms of recency, but I, I would, you know, um, also argue that these problems have been on film now for their last couple of group games. I mean, we saw both Portugal and the Netherlands target weaker areas of this team on the pitch. And it was, it's pretty blatant that there are some huge question marks in that middle third right now for this United States women's national team. We've seen oppositions go ahead and try to counter that with numbers and try to expose some areas there. And it has worked. It has worked out in, in their favor. It led to an early goal for, for Netherlands and it, it nearly worked out for, for Portugal in this, in this final match day. And I think the struggle coming out of losing that midfield battle is we're not seeing um, the plan B. We're not seeing okay. the adjustment from a team that we're so used to, um, you know, seeing make those adjustments. Uh, where are they coming from and how is it going to look moving forward? And if I'm Sweden, the blueprint is there at this point to go up against this United States side. So I think there is an understandable level of concern that, again, comes with all of those expectations as a reigning champion and a number one ranked team. And that is absolutely on head coach Vlako Andonovsky's plate. That is something that he and his coaching staff are going to have to try to figure out and address moving forward. OK, so... There is great trepidation about Sweden on Sunday then. Look, the history between these two teams have always been close and tense. It's going to be their sixth overall meeting between each, each other. So there's a familiarity between the, the history of these two countries. Uh, but the United States have a little bit of history on their side and that they've had, I think, three of the wins, one going uh, by way of a, of a draw between the two of them. But I think what's what makes uh, this next coming game so intriguing is the fact that there are so many new players for the United States. For mm. them, it will be perhaps their their first introduction to a, a rivalry like this. And um, it will be because Andonovsky is going to have, you know, to make some forced adjustments here. There is going to be no Rose Lavelle available in this game uh, after picking up an additional yellow card and she will have to serve suspension there. So what will happen in that, that midfield trio? Or will we see uh, a change in, in formation to try to really shake things up against uh, Sweden? I think that's possibly the best bet for this coaching staff moving forward. I mean, in, in the 2019 World Cup, the United States played in a 4-3-3. It was what they did. Mm. And in that quarterfinal against France, they shaked things up a little bit to kind of close out and ensure the win. And at the end of the match, former manager uh, Corinne Dockrick said that that was something that France was unprepared for, mm. to handle the switch in formation and switch in tactics from the United States because of what all of the footage that has been out on, on this United States team. So... Uh, I think with everything that's been out there in 2023, I think Sweden will feel a sense of confidence, but they are also of the understanding that this is a team that uh, can strike at any moment. So I think it'll make for wonderful knockout soccer and um, probably a lot of uh, broken hearts for, for the betting kind. Okay. Uh, did I read as well, Sandra, are the team or certainly a fair quotient of the team not singing the national anthem? If that's true, what's that about? I don't know if that's that 
it's they're not seeing it. And um, I'm not someone who is going to try to humor the concept of anthem discourse. I think it comes from a targeted specific sector of Americans who are looking to seek out division where there shouldn't be. Um, players are participating in the anthem respectfully and the ways in which they want to uh, pay homage to the anthem ceremonies. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that should be a, a, non, a non-topic. Yeah, but am I right? Are a bunch of them not singing? Is that a topic elsewhere? I there's been nothing on. Uh, there's been nothing on record from players okay. uh, saying, "I am not. I am refusing to sing the anthem." There's been nothing on record from players okay. saying that. And if yeah. I was to observe them during the anthem, are they all not singing? No, <laughs> there's definitely a mix of players who have okay. eyes closed and want to sing harmoniously. There are others who are focused and locked in. Um, Every it's a team of individuals, and perhaps uh, it's showing in more ways than one, right? Yeah, okay. I hadn't um, seen it personally. I had just read that point, so I wasn't sure to what extent it was the case. And that's not blown up into some kind of talking point stateside anyway, has it? I think there are folks who want to try to make it a talking point. Okay. Um, but um, as far as I'm concerned, if it's if there's nothing coming out from players specifically, why why make a why highlight a talking point um, from created by others who want to create discourse? Okay. Which team has impressed you most then? Who are the favorites for this World Cup all of a sudden? I think Japan is absolutely up there in terms of a team that can really disappoint and surprise and and upset some other teams along the way. Uh, I think they have been put in a group alongside Spain and they've played some competition that uh, others consider below them. So maybe they're going to get their first real shot at playing up to competition um, in the knockout rounds. But I still think that they play a very lovely style of football, tactical on the ball, smart uh, in their movement and will really make things difficult no matter who they're going up against in the elimination rounds. Um, and uh, look, I, I've had Colombia as uh, as a dark horse going into okay. this tournament uh, as well. I'd, I'd love to see them continue being you know successful. I thought they had a phenomenal, gutsy, historic performance against uh, Germany and ended up pulling off the win. And I hope they continue to maybe have some more surprises along the ways but in, in terms of a favorite I'm I'm looking at Japan I'm also looking at, at England um, as a team that is probably the definitive example of utilizing the group stage to peak at the right time so a couple of nervy performances from the Lionesses themselves um, have lost Kira Walsh but obviously closing out their group stage with a massive blowout win is is the type of temperature you want to have going into uh, the, the next round. So I'm um, looking at Japan, I'm looking at England as, as, as maybe some some contenders and uh, Colombia is maybe my dark horse. And I guess this is a point which is probably made about each successive World Cup, but this is the biggest, the most viewed, the most attended, another step forward for the game. Has it impressed you in general terms, Sandra? Has it been what you hoped this World Cup would be so far? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, thank you for, you know, the the framing on on the question, because I think leading into this particular tournament, um, there's with any World Cup, Women's World Cup specifically, there's always been discussion about the United States as as their favorites or contenders or, or really some, you know, other European giants like like Germany or France or England, you know, the emphasis on on these quote unquote contenders right but i think this is the first world cup where going into it having the expanded field to 32 teams the eight debutantes that there was a little bit of uh, unexpected layer there like is this the tournament where we're going to finally see some real big upsets and i think this is the tournament that's actually uh delivered that i i think that there's been a couple of group games and hopefully we'll continue to see this in in the knockout rounds but uh, there's been some group games that have kind of introduced national team programs to the world i think folks can get often fixated um 
on on the ratings of teams. And we're now going to see, you know, uh, Nigeria, Colombia, South Africa, Jamaica um, as national team programs who have exited, you know, their group and are going to continue to compete for the possibility of a, of a World Cup title. Mm. And I think if if you found yourself as someone very fixated on on our number or ranking of a team that you're finding a lot of surprises here uh, along the way. And and for those of us who have maybe had to be a little deeper in into women's soccer, maybe we aren't so surprised, but it is so nice to kind of see all of these things come to fruition um, and see the, the surprises along the way. And just the last one, uh, I know you'd be very familiar stateside with Denise O'Sullivan, but uh, Sinead Farley, I'm curious uh, to what extent, if at all, I mean, every country is very focused on how they're going themselves. Has her return to football in a big way and playing 90 minutes at a World Cup and featuring in all of Ireland's games, has that caught the eye of uh, the media over there? Had any traction? Because certainly it's been a big part of the Irish experience supporting this team. Oh, absolutely. I I think um, going into this World Cup, Ireland was a team that left their mark on the hearts of Americans. They they were the last team that the United States had faced in an April international window ahead of the World Cup. And this was billed by U.S. soccer as the final pair of friendlies before the... 23 player World Cup roster would be named. So there was a lot of eyes and attention and fixation on these games. And Denise O'Sullivan has has been a player who has also played in NWSL for a very long time. But the return of Sinead Fairley and and her story in back to playing professional soccer, I think has been a big, big story for folks who are invested in the game. Uh, you know, having gone through unfortunate, terrible circumstances and trauma uh, during the early days of the National Women's Soccer League and bringing these allegations to light and then taking some time away from the pitch and then eventually working her way back in to club play and finding herself playing in a World Cup. I don't I don't know if any of us could have written that in our wildest dreams. But Sinead Fairley went out and wrote that for herself. So, you know, there was a a lot of attention and a lot of excitement uh, from Americans for Ireland, I think, as they went off into the World Cup. Uh, I'm local to to Chicago and there is an NWSL Women's Professional Club here. um, And they have a United States national team player who unfortunately fell short of making the roster. But Tierna Davidson um, at one point was walking into a game day with her uh, Ireland kit and she had the jersey on and representing it. So there was a lot, there was a buzz okay. about this team. And uh, it, it's unfortunate to see them fall just short. Um, I think I, we, I mentioned earlier about the the football gods, right? And I think this was one of them. And they unfortunately got got put in a draw where it was a very, very tough group Mm. to get out of. But I think it was uh, lived up to the billing because they're a tough team themselves. And I think they showed that throughout this World Cup. Sandra, we're out of time, but uh, we'll be tuning in now to USA, Sweden, uh, expecting something pretty interesting and tense. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Cheers. Sandra Herrera there of CBS Sports with us from uh, Chicago. And the Women's World Cup show on Off the Ball is with thanks to Sure Nonstop Protection Deodorant, official sponsor of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023. The Women's World Cup show on Off the Ball with Sure Nonstop Protection Deodorant, official sponsor of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023.